this is a bow saw. Bow saws are a good lightweight saw for light clearing, maybe trees and logs up to eight or ten inches. Yeah, you don't need to apply a lot of pressure. The weight of it and the sharpness of the blade lets it cut right through. You can throw away the blade as soon as it's dull, but a good trick to know is that it's not always a dull blade that's your problem. Sometimes the teeth get out of set, and if you take a pair of needle nose pliers or a crescent wrench and grip each tooth and bend it slightly in the direction that it was bent at the factory, it'll usually cut again for you. This is a folding pruning saw. They're really good for cutting limbs where you don't have a lot of space. This is another type of pruning saw. The blade on this saw can be sharpened with a regular chainsaw file, so anyone can sharpen it. That's a real advantage. Crosscut saws have been made in all different shapes and sizes and with different tooth patterns for different purposes. This two-man saw is a bucking saw. It has a straight back. It's fairly stiff, so one person can use it. It has lance teeth with four cutters and two rakers, so it will work well in softwood like pine. This is a felling saw. It also has lance teeth. It's a felling saw because it has a suede back and a thinner belly and it's a lot more flexible. This dandy saw has plain teeth. They're all little triangles. It might work pretty well in hardwood. And this one-man saw has perforated lance teeth. They'd work well in a soft wood. Right now, trail crews usually use whatever saw they can get their hands on that's good and sharp and in shape. And since a felling saw or falling saw is lighter to carry, that might be more practical even if you are bucking logs. Warren Miller has written the classic book on cross-cut saw care and maintenance. And I think anyone who's going to use a cross-cut saw should at least read that and have some exposure to the care and filing of cross-cut saws. Most of the saws that we use are vintage saws, such as Atkins or Distin or Simons, and they're not made anymore. Now, if you want a good saw, you've got to get an old saw. When you find an old saw, you can check the thickness, and you can actually feel the thickness of the metal with your fingertips believe it or not, and a, a good size concentric taper ground where the center of the back is the thinnest metal, quite a bit thinner than the teeth, and that way without even setting the teeth it cuts a wider kerf than the width of the body of the saw. You can't tune and file a saw in the field. Filing or tuning without a good vise is almost sure to ruin the saw. So it's best not to try to do that in the field. If your saw is sharp, it pulls out long curls of wood, maybe six or eight inch long curls of wood and green wood. If your saw is bringing out sawdust, it's dull. It's terribly dull. Your saw will stay sharp all season, maybe two seasons if you're not using it too much. If you keep it out of the dirt, never saw through dirt, don't let it rust keep it sheathed and don't drop it or knock it over. I really try to impress on my crews that they'd better not hurt that saw. But we keep them covered with the light oil anytime they're in moisture and anytime we bring it back into the station we oil it so that it doesn't get you know ambient moisture from the air. There, there's a whole bunch of guards. Sometimes I transport most saws between two slabs of plywood that are greased on the inside. I've seen two really bad wrecks um, with outfitter stock that's come from the saw coming untied on one side of the animal and then in brush or whatever coming unsheathed and the animal spun around and cut up a bunch of other animals around them. When we're transporting one or a bunch of saws long distances, uh, we'll have them sheathed and we'll have them wrapped in a mani and bent over the animal and it will be tied to the forks of the saddle and then tied down either to the latigo or the double cinch on each side with the teeth facing backwards. 
And then for shorter saws, oftentimes one person saws, um, which are often packed on stock, will be in a wooden sheath where the handle's out and the sheath will strap to the pack animal. I use fire hose. It's cheap and replaceable and readily available everywhere. And I use strings of parachute cord or Velcro to tie it onto the saw. The most injuries I've seen with cross-cut saws are people putting on the sheaths and taking off the sheaths and handling them too quickly. Where I work, the sun's really intense and the saw blade can get very hot. And if you've taken your gloves off to tie the knots in the string or to remove the Velcro and then pick up the saw, it almost burns your hands and I've seen people drop the saw suddenly. If you're not going terribly far or with a shorter saw, you can put it on your shoulder with the teeth facing away from your neck, take off the rear handle, hold on to the front handle, and carry it that way. You wouldn't want to leave them strung for long or they might hold the bend. There hasn't been a lot of official training for cross-cut sawing. The danger in a lot of falling and bucking operation comes from the trees, not from the saw. So I'd recommend that anyone who's going to do a lot of bucking go out with someone who can teach them about bucking, whether they're using a cross-cut saw or a chainsaw. And I'm assuming that we'll have more regular type training programs available soon. What's coming into play now is that it's start cross-cut saw training is being attached to the chainsaw training as part of that, you know, if, if people are going to be used cross-cut so that it can be used more responsibly. We'll need to make one cut down here off the trail far enough to give the pack animals clearance when they come by. The other cut I'd like to make up here where it's suspended off the ground. No matter where we cut, the tree is under a lot of compression and it's going to tend to pinch the saw. And we won't have any trouble moving a bigger log as opposed to a smaller log because it's on such a steep hill it's going to want to move. We want to make both our cuts at compound angles, opening up this way so the log will roll downhill. It's a real shame to make your cuts at the wrong angle and wedge your log in place and have to start all over again with a cross cut. And I just as soon make the upper cut first and that'll relieve the compression for the second cut. There's no use fighting compression on both cuts if you don't have to. As far as safety, for both cuts we're going to want to finish from the uphill side with one person bucking. We're going to want to be aware that there's a chance the upper part could come down the hill too if the root wad gives way. You swamp out the area where you're going to stand to cut. You decide where your body position is going to be so that you can pull that crosscut saw alongside your body, not towards yourself. You want to have good footing and have all the vegetation out of the way of the saw so it'll run smoothly. We'll take and scrape out some footholds with a Pulaski. We may have to move some rocks out of the way. We may have to move a lot of other logs and down debris out of the way. Then if the tree has thick or dirty bark or charred bark, you are doing best to chop that away with an ax so you won't dull the saw. Then you unsheath the saw and put the sheath where you can find it and hand one end of it across the log to your partner. Get in your positions. Start pulling gently. Sometimes one person needs to reach out and kind of guide the center of the back of the saw until the cut gets started. Oftentimes you can saw through wood um, for a long time and never need anything on that. Or you could get into a ponderosa pine or a fir that's real pitchy and you're going to need to get rid of that uh, pitch with the saw because it'll bind it right up. Hey, that helps. If um, you have some type of solvent and what we're recommending now is a citrus based solvent to remove that pitch, but get rid of the pitch immediately. After you've started a cut, if there's going to be any chance of compression you want to put in a wedge or maybe two if it's a big log, you put in wedges at 10 and 2 o'clock 
drive them in. You don't want any chance of pinching that saw because it's very hard to get it back out. Then when two people start sawing together, especially when it's the first time they've worked as partners, they need to figure out how to work as partners. And the saw will teach them and they'll teach each other. Sometimes there's a lot of yelling involved. But that's kind of how it works. When you're working with a new partner and you're not used to sawing together, you may end up watching your partner saw and watching how his saw is. If there's any bend in it, that saw is going to be binding and fighting as it goes through the wood. And you end up facing the main part of the saw with your body and pulling that saw right straight across your body underneath. And again, as you're pulling, you're not pulling straight, but you're following the arc that's created by the saw. As you get better and better at running, you'll hear it change. And it'll change from sounding like it's working, going through the wood to a point where it's singing. And when that happens, there's almost no effort in sawing. You can pull with one finger and each person can just pull it back and forth. And they can tell when they're doing it right because the saw will sound better, the chips will fly, nobody will be pulled off balance. But it's something you learn as you work with a partner. When you use wedges a lot of times is keeping that open and oftentimes the log may roll and as it rolls it's going to pinch. So then a lot of times what we'll do is we'll wedge it and we'll drive an axe or a Pulaski head spanning the curve of the cut to hold that log and keep it from rolling. And there's ways that you can control some pretty large um, logs, sometimes up to a couple tons with just one Pulaski driven in there and it's a real safe way to do it. Then as you cut through and get close to where the log may shift or may fall through, usually you take the handle off of the downhill side or whichever side has become hardest to saw from and let one person finish the cut. Yeah. And that one person finishing the cut should use just the teeth on the end of the saw and if the saw does drop down into the dirt, you're going to dull the end teeth, which don't matter quite as much as the middle teeth. Okay. So when the tree is wide in comparison to the length of the saw, or when the tree is large diameter, we can't clear our chips with two people because we can't pull far enough to get the chips out so the saw will start to bind up. When that happens, we usually go to single bucking and then we can take a longer stroke and we can clear our chips which actually makes single bucking in this case less effort than double bucking with a short saw. If the log is going to drop into a trench in the trail from which you will then have to roll it up out of, it's pretty smart to put logs that will act as ramps down there that it can roll along Anytime you can use a mechanical advantage and move that tree out of the way, the easier you can do it, the better it's going to be. And if you can even get by without even cutting the log, that's better yet if there's some way to move that efficiently out of there. If there's a possibility of that saw falling through into the dirt, we'll take a piece of bark off the tree with the axe or with the Pulaski and lay it under a clean piece and lay it underneath there just as to double up our chance of not um, doing anything to the sharpness of that saw. You may want to cut poles to use as levers or use your pry bars and have them underneath the log so that when it drops free you can lift up on the levers and push it out of there. Pretty much you need your creativity and you need a good sense of mechanical advantage and you need to figure all this out before you've cut the log. These are loppers, all different types. They're really good for brushing, cutting brush along trails. There are two basic types of lopper. This is the anvil type, where the blade cuts square against an immovable anvil. And this is the hook and blade type, or bypass lopper, where the blade slides by a hook. You use them both the same. For either type, you hold the handles down at the end and grip what you're going to cut and squeeze straight. You never want to twist. 
The hook and blade shear is handy on limbs because you can sort of hook it over what you're going to cut. That's sort of self-seeding. When you need to sharpen them, the anvil type is different than the hook and blade type. On the anvil one, you sharpen each side of the blade, and you want to keep it straight so it still meets the anvil squarely. The hook and blade or bypass type is like a pair of scissors. You only want to sharpen the outside of the blade. If you sharpen the inside, you'll absolutely ruin the tool. I've got three more cutting tools. This one is a bush hook or a brush hook, depending on what part of the country you come from. It's got a good leather sheath. This is another bush hook or brush hook. These are sharp on both sides of the blade. They're good for cutting small diameter vegetation. They've got a heavy head and a long handle, so you can get a lot of momentum. They can also be very dangerous if you're not watching out for your other crew members and your own feet. Well, rather than chopping like you would with an ax, you want to sort of pull it towards you and slice as you swing. And this is a Sandvik. It's got a replaceable blade. It's very lightweight and it'll cut through things that an axe won't cut through in one swipe because of the narrow blade, almost machete-like. Plasky's probably the main implement used for firefighting. It's also used quite a bit in trail. It's got a chopping or cutting edge which is filed on both sides and then filed pretty sharp for chopping and then a, um, a mattock or hoe end to it which is filed on the inside of the curve and that's used for moving dirt or small rocks, stuff like that. When you're pulling dirt and you're pulling it towards you a lot of times when people, and myself included, started doing it, you pull almost in a straight line and that's nowhere near as effective as if it's angled slightly. And when you're angled, you're actually cutting, almost like a plow moving through the dirt. You're cutting dirt as you're moving, and then it's a lot easier to, to remove it from the tread. A lot of times people that are you know, working with the Pulaski all the time, again, are using their legs as the main source of power for it. If you're carrying a tool like a Pulaski over distance, it should be sheathed. The sharpest cutting implement on the Pulaski should be still facing away from you on the downhill side so that if you fall you can get rid of it. It's usually a good idea to have at least 10 feet between people. So a lot of times with the hoe end we'll sharpen it at the end or the beginning of each trail hitch and that'll often be sharpened with a grinder because you can take that down. The cutting end of the Pulaski is different because you don't want to change the temper and make it too hard so or too soft. So a lot of times we'll file out with a file rather than using a grinder. A combination or a combi tool has, it's a small shovel that can be rotated and turned downwards for a hoe and on the far end of it is pick. So when it's turned into the hoe position, you've got a hoe on one side and a pick on the other side and that hoe is also really good for cutting roots. It's also a very small fairly narrow base shovel which can be pretty good for cleaning water bars and um, areas which are, where you're doing a lot of work on drainage. Um, a cloud is almost shaped like a much wider hoe with teeth or a long rake end on the other side and it's heavy enough for cutting light roots and for moving a fair amount of light or decomposed granitic soil types where there's not much compaction or adhesion within within the, the dirt itself. Council tool is almost like a section off a sickle bar mower, which usually has four or five teeth on it and it's triangular. It's sharp and it's used for lighter litter and duff for removing that. You use a straight pick or a miner's pick for prying rocks out of the ground or fracturing rock that has 
veins or weak points in it. When you're using a pick, it's really important that you be wearing long pants and sleeves, of course, and a hard hat and safety glasses. With any of the heavy swinging tools, you want to have your feet shoulder width apart and swing it up behind you, clear over your head, then straighten your arms, let your hands slide down to the ends of the handle like you would with a baseball bat, and then bend at the knees and let the lowering of your body accelerate the tool so it hits the ground really hard. You kind of keep your back straight as you do this and it's not hard on your back if you're doing it right. You really use your legs a lot and bend your knees. Pickmatic has a pointed pick tip on one end and an adds hoe type blade on the other end. They're really good for grubbing new tread into heavy rocky soil. They've got more weight to them than an adds hoe or a Pulaski and you can swing hard and pull a lot of material with them and also pry heavy rocks with the pick end. The cuttermatic is like the pickmatic only instead of a pick point opposite the mattock side you've got a sort of short dull axe and that's heavy duty and you can cut roots with it real well. There's been a lot of different shaped axes from tiny hatchets, which can be used for shingling or splitting shingles, to broad axes, which would be on the other end of the scale, which would be used for hewing wood and flattening sides of wood. A single bit or a pole axe just has one cutting surface, the other end is flat or blunt, and the balance is really different. Traditionally, most um, double bit axes have a longer handle single bit axes will often have a shorter handle and there's advantages and disadvantages to both. A double bit axe in actuality is probably a little more versatile because it has one edge that's filed for cutting wood and it's filed fairly thin and narrow for chopping. The other edge of it is filed at a chisel edge and that chisel edge is for getting down near the ground and, and removing roots where you're not going to chip it if you hit the occasional stone. An axe, if it's used properly, is a real safe tool. An axe, if you cut corners, it can be a real dangerous tool. The one thing that we've seen in the past that have been injury related and injuries to ankles or feet has come down to one simple thing. If when you're chopping on a log, if you never let your axe handle break a plane that's parallel with the ground as you're chopping, then you can't cut your feet. And the only time we break that rule is when we're chopping with the log between our body and the axe head. If you've already made the decision to chop the log, the first thing I do again is look at the log, figure out what I'm going to do with it. Where's the best place to chop it? If you're limbing on a downed log, you should try to have, try to be limbing the log on the opposite side from where you're standing. In other words, keep the log between you and your, and your axe. The second part is when you're limbing, a lot of times you'll see that the axe head goes through some of the limbs really easy. So it's pretty easy to get wild in a situation like that. So you should be really clear on where other people are and you should be really clear on where your swing is going. Yeah, there's a lot of times when no matter how hard you try, you have to limb on the same side of the log that you're standing on. And when that happens, just be doubly sure never to let your axe handle or your axe head drop below the level of your hands as you're chopping. The third is when you're swinging is to make sure that you have a clear area in the complete, within the complete radius or arc of your swing. When you're doing that you don't want your axe when it's over your head even to hit a little branch. So sometimes there might be a little branch that's out of the radius of your swing but it's going to be catching your eye and it's going to be interfering with your vision the whole time. And if that's there, take the time to remove it. It's trying to be as sufficient as possible. So you're going to strike that wood as many times as it takes to completely sever your cutting surface and then move to the other side. Instead of making a chop on one side, a chop on the other side, a chop on this side, a chop on this side, three times in succession and then breaking it. Oftentimes in a large log, you're not going to be able to remove your first chips by making 
a wide cut. So you'll start with a narrower V in your cut and you'll cut down until your V comes to closure or to a point and then you'll go back up and usually on the strongest side that you have you'll reopen your cut so that it's wider. And as you come down at first you take a lot of care to develop accuracy. It doesn't matter. The power does not matter at first. Again, I'm flexing at the knees, especially when I get near this part of the cut, so my axe handle stays parallel. So work on your accuracy as you're coming down. And only after you have that balance and that accuracy, then power becomes the third part of the equation. Wait until you're good at chopping before you try to put power into it. A lot of times when you're swinging, and you pick the axe up and it goes back past your head on either side and you'll catch out of the corner of your eye a little chip of wood that's stuck on the axe blade. You should not try to power through that chip. When you try to power down through it, it can deflect your axe and you can end up with an injury. I also ended up taking my gloves off part way through because it's getting pretty hot out here and my hands started getting sweaty and what we're looking at is the least chance of having an injury. And with sweaty hands and the chance of the, the axe slipping out of your gloves or your hands, it's not worth it. So always do whatever you can to minimize the possibility of an injury to yourself or anybody around you. When I finish this first cut, I'll go over and I'll cut a V on the opposite side of the log. And because the wood is already removed from the near side, when I come over to this side, it's about five or six times as quick to chop. So when I start it, just come down and start my chip. My chip will start out like that. Okay, now my V is closing up. And where I want my V to close up is right in the very center of the log. It's closing up a little bit sooner. This time I'm going to open it up on the left side and the reason is is because there's a knot that's closer on the right side so it's going to be easier chopping on this left side of the log. We've had a lot of injuries in the past. You get working with an axe and all of a sudden you get to the point where you're medium proficient and when that happens it becomes fun and it's like man am I having a good time chopping and that's when I've seen most of the injuries occur is when people finally start having fun and they start chopping harder and harder and I've tried to remind myself of that and so every time I start having a lot of fun I go wait a minute slow down make sure you're not going to hurt yourself and then proceed more slowly <laughs>a lot of sledgehammers in trail work because I worked in rocky country and we've got hammers ranging from 3 to 20 pounds with round heads, square heads and chisel or peen shaped heads. We use 8, 12 or 20 pound sledgehammers for crushing rock. The main focus on technique that I want to be showing is that I'm bending my knees, bringing the hammer down flat my arms straight and swing from the shoulder. For shaping rocks you can use four, eight, or twelve pound spalling hammers and they have a peen on one end that you can split the rock with by hitting a line of blows along where you want it to break. And the four pound ones are really handy for shaping rocks to build water bars or walls with. And we use the three, four, five pound hammers for chinking rocks into walls, for driving stakes, for driving feathers and wedges to split rocks, and for shaping rock. A lot of times we'll use big heavy mauls for moving or locating timbers, but that's a real different job than when you're moving rock. The biggest sledgehammer I've seen is my old favorite 20 pounder. And we've used that to crush rock, and we've used it to bust rocks that stuck up in the trail. Actually saved a lot of time we would have spent blasting. It takes technique to swing it, but if you've got the right technique, it's not that hard.
people use ads hoes and grub hoes in areas of the country where there's a lot of loose light soil and maybe some root structure in there the ads hoe is sharpened so it'll cut through those roots and you can pull the dirt towards you when you're digging in a trail bench there are all kinds of shovels I like the long handled wide bladed shovel for moving dirt in a lot of trail jobs you need to be able to throw dirt from one place to another and for that you need a big wide bladed shovel with a long handle the firefighting shovel is a standard in the Forest Service and they're sharp enough that you can cut through sod and chop through roots well with them. When I'm using a shovel I use my foot to drive the blade into the dirt and then I lever it across my knees or thighs. I can also use a shovel to scrape by levering it against my body. It's a lot easier on your back that way. If you're digging a lot of things up you're probably going to need a bar as well as a shovel. The tamping bar is usually five or six feet long and round and has a flat paddle blade on one end and a big round flattened tamping end on the other. And they're good for digging post holes and tamping the dirt back in, but they're not good for prying. <laughs> You can use rock bars to move anything. Uh, I always liked the rock bar best of all the tools. It was the great equalizer for me with a five foot rock bar. I've got one I called my magic rock bar and if nobody was looking I could move anything. And nobody could figure out how I did it. But there are a thousand and one ways to use a rock bar. You can put it under the rock and lift using the ground as a fulcrum. You can put a fulcrum in front of the rock and pry off of that. You can use a rowing motion to skid a rock along the ground or work with two people and row your boat rock across the ground. You can stab it in the ground to bump a rock forward. They're a very useful tool for moving heavy rocks or logs. The bottom end of a good rock bar is square with a chisel tip and that chisel tip is a two inch fulcrum basically that you can use to lift with and then the upper end of it is usually round. It's best with big rocks to have a team of people. Once you start using rock bars to move a rock you don't want anybody in there with their hands on the rock because a rock bar can slide across that rock and mash fingers. Okay, a timber carrier would usually be about three and a half feet long with a swinging hook in the center of it. And it's a, it's a two-sided hook that goes in and picks up a log. Okay. And when you have a lot of people and fairly big logs, you can get a lot of people on it and carrying it in a pretty safe fashion. A draw knife, again, is one of those tools that looks like it's pretty simple, but people that are really good at peeling with it, you'll see they have a very definite technique. The same as with a Pulaski. A lot of times you don't pull straight towards you. You actually angle the draw knife at 20 or 30 degree angle so that it's doing some cutting as it's pulling back in, in the direction of your body. On an axe like this, this axe, is, the handle's been in about 10 years and it's beginning to warp. It's, there's no cracks in it or anything like that, but it's still not worth keeping because something's going to happen to this eventually. So we're going to replace the head on this. And if you're taking the time to go through and um, put a new handle into a tool and so do it properly, you might as well select a good handle rather than use one that's poor. One thing that we look at right off the bat is, is the handle straight? And if you hold it up and look at it by letting it dangle, you'll see if it's straight and you'll see if it's warped in either way. The second is, how is the grain laying in that handle? A lot of handles will have the grain going crosswise. And when you're thinking about a cross grain and then you're striking down with that tool like this, there's a real good chance of that handle separating sometime later during the use. 
So for the maximum strength for the wood that's involved, we look for grain that runs straight right down through the length of the handle. And that grain should be fairly tight with tighter growth rings because the tighter growth rings mean a stronger piece of wood. Other times, and you'll see this more commonly, you'll have the sapwood and the other harder wood, which is there's a line between it. One of the woods white and one is darker. When you have something like that, again, if you're using it, that wood will expand and contract at different rates. And through work, there's a good chance that even if it's a straight grained handle with these different colored woods, you're going to end up with this handle not lasting anywhere near as long as it would with a real nice straight tight grained handle like this first one. When we remove this handle, we'll start by sawing it off right along here. And once it's sawn, it'll be placed in a vise or in a proper dehandling tool and the rest of the handle or the rest of the handle that's inside the head will be pushed out through the top of the head rather than down through the bottom of the head. If an axe head, if the handle is really stuck in an old head, you can help by drilling it out from either the top or bottom or both sides. There's a single sock earth right down through the center of these handles. And when you think about laying a head on the handle, this head is going to seat right down near the fatter part of the handle. So it's going to be down this far. So what I'd do before I even began it was I'd take and draw a line across this handle here and I'd cut that off because this much is going to be sticking out. I don't want to mess with taking the time to shape that extra piece of wood. Then we'd take a thin saw, a thin bladed saw, and we'd cut and bring this saw curve down another inch. If you look at this handle in profile, there's a really big lump right here, and then the head comes in here. If you take your head and you bring it down as close to that lump as possible, you want this lump to blend into this wood. And all the stress of chopping is right on this part, and that's where these cracks usually develop. If you take and you remove some of this wood, by rasping it down before you put the handle in, you're actually increasing the strength of your overall handle. And you're doing two things. You're increasing the flex and you're decreasing the chance that this handle will break right at this point. I just put my belt sander upside down in the vise and then just start rocking the handle itself on the belt sander and you can take it down real smoothly and efficiently that way. And that's turned out to be one of the best things that I've done. So it fits tightly. And when you put the head on, it's only going to slide part way down the handle. When you do that, you turn the axe handle over, the head's part way on it, and you pound down with a piece of wood or a rubber hammer, and that head will actually slide up the handle as you're pounding down on the wood. You'll find that it gets caught, and you can knock that head back off again with a piece of wood or a hammer. You knock the head off, and you'll see right on the handle itself, where it's digging into the wood, or there might be a little bit of mark there, and that's where you're going to rasp down. So the head itself, as it slides on, will tell you the, the fat spots where you have to rasp off. A lot of times it's real easy to rasp too far on one side or too far on the other, and the head will be sitting off from the axis of the handle. When the axe head is finally sat down all the way to where you want it, and it's seated square on the handle, you've got this hole up on top, and we've thrown away our plastic wedge, and what we usually use are wooden wedges. And we'll drive that wooden wedge as far down into the handle as it goes. And then we'll saw off the top of the wedge where it's sticking out. And once that's done, we'll usually seat it with one or two Grady wedges. And these are little metal wedges with steps. Some of the pole axes or single bits that we have will come with a lot heavier handles on them. And these single bits, oftentimes, these are pretty nice handles that they come with. They come as blanks. It's really rough through here. And you'll sand these handles down so they fit your personal hand. These handles come varnished. And this varnish is not a real advantage in a lot of ways because the handle isn't going to keep, it'll dry out with the varnish on it. If you remove the varnish with sandpaper, 
when you end up with that, then you can coat the whole handle with linseed oil and keep the wood really oiled and supple. Anytime we're dealing with work with cutting implements, whether they're tools or knives or saws, the sharper they are and the better shape they are, the more effective they're going to be. This is a not atypical Pulaski that we pulled out of the back of a pickup. And in addition to sharpness, we're also really concerned with the shape of the head. If you see how this is rounded, and you start thinking about chopping on rounded logs or chopping on rounded limbs and thinking of two round objects coming into contact with each other, they tend to slide off each other. If you look at a squared head or one that's flattened across the cutting surface, and if this strikes a rounded object, there's going to be a lot less chance of it glancing off and hitting you or ending up in the ground. The second part about head shape is if you take a board and you think about a round head coming into contact with this, it's only contacting in a very small area of the cutting surface. It's contacting at one time. So when you only have so much energy and you're chopping, you're not getting a very effective use of your energy for the amount of work that you're putting into it. When we look at this head here and we think about it coming into contact with a the board, there's a lot more efficiency. So that's basically what we do with head shape. When we start with a lot of tools when they come as blanks and they're not used and we start filing them in order to bring this back to a flattened shape we'll do most of our filing from this point here to this point here and we'll let the edges take care of themselves when we're filing we want to be careful have your gloves on have a file guard and handle there when we're filing Usually we use a single cut mill bastard file that's either 10 or 12 inches long. And the single cut means that there's serrations on the file that are running at an angle to the file but they're only one, running in one direction. This, this file is used and you only cut on the push stroke. You don't pull, you just pick it up and you cut on the push stroke again. Most of the time that we're filing Pulaski's or double bitted axes, we'll drive them into a log or a stump. I'll drive the implement that I'm filing at a slight angle so that the top surface that I'm filing is facing slightly towards me. So that I don't have to lean over the tool and file directly down into it. I'd rather be able to stay back and file at a slight angle to the tool. So I'll end up going down and filing the center of the tool first. And then when I have to finish it up, I'll finish up by finishing on both ends. Once this side is finished, I'll go around and I'll do the other side. When you end up getting both sides done, what you're going to have is a slight wire edge. Or you can see it by looking in the proper light. That wire edge can also be taken off with, with an axe stone, take the smooth edge, we just go real lightly in a circular fashion on that wire edge until it disappears. Once you have that wire edge there and you've taken it off, there's no axes or Pulaski's that you shouldn't be able to shave with. The one way that I can tell very easily is I will take my glove off and I'll take my finger and I'll touch my fingernail to it. And if it sinks into the fingernail with no weight, it's sharp enough to shave it. But I don't bring my finger down, bring it so only the fingernail is exposed to that head. When we turn over and we go on the chisel edge, we do the same thing, but when we're filing on the chisel edge, we end up filing at a much steeper angle. And that's to try to keep this cutting edge thicker, and this is the part that we use for roots. Once we're finished with this, and it's done, we'll usually grease the axe and put it in a sheath. 